Good day and welcome to Church of the King Online. My name is Sharma Rainau. I'm your online campus pastor. And we have a very, very special relationship topic today for you in our relationship series. But before I get too far into the message, let's just do all the housekeeping and get it out of the way. First off, if this is your first, second, millionth time seeing one of these online sermons, seeing one of our things online, I want to invite you to get connected because transformation does not just happen alone, but it happens in relationships. And the best way that we know how to connect with you is for you to fill out the digital connect form available on our website in the description box or in the comments right now. And then I want to take a moment and say thank you for your generosity. It's because of your selfless giving that we get to do things like this, that we get to be online in this time and that we get to do ministry in Lake Charles and in Kinder and all over the world. So I want to say thank you for your generosity. Just a testimony from it. Because of your giving, we've been able to do such an amazing work in our local community that the next Sunday after recording this, we're baptizing over 20 kids. And that is amazing to see them just take up the godly commission to go into the nations, be baptized in them, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And that's because of your partnership and your donation that we get to reach out to them. So I want to say thank you for that. If you want to give today, you can do so with the info available on screen or in the description box or in the comments down below. Now, without further ado, let me introduce to you our very special guest speaker along with me, my wife, Andri Nal. Oh, it's so good to be with you. Thank you so much, Shami. It's such a blessing to be here to share God's word. We haven't done this in a very long time. We used to preach a uh, with each other a lot of times and so we are so grateful and thankful to have this moment to share God's word with you. I'm so grateful that we get to do week two and the title of this message is how to fight fair. Now the basic premise of this relationship series is we're not just talking about relationships in the romantic sense even though they are very important. This is for no matter where you are in your relationship journey because we're all called to be in relationships and so If you feel like I'm not married, I might have gone through a divorce, I might be widowed, I might be single, I might be a teenager, and this is the first time that I'm ever hearing about this. These are principles that we have learned, and just disclaimer, we've been only married now for three and a half years, we've been together for five, but so these are by no means just tips that we have by ourselves. These are things that we've researched and asked some people that are experts in the topic, And that's why we're sharing this with you. If you want to check out last week's message, I want to encourage you to do so. Pastor Tadimus Lisa, get really vulnerable and deep into what makes a good godly marriage. But so this week, we're going to talk about how to fight fair. And so I like to think of conflict in a relationship is almost like a traffic jam. It is 90% of the time impossible for us to know what caused it just by seeing it. And it just suddenly happens. Suddenly there's like blockage on the road. Suddenly there's like a million people backed up. And then for some or other odd reason, it just goes away and everyone continues on with their day. And that sometimes feels like conflict. We don't know rightly where it started. We don't know exactly every single detail. But afterwards with some retrospection, we could see, oh, okay, But also the important thing is, without a GBS, we're not going to be able to see what's ahead of us. And in our Christian walk, we have that GPS, the godly positioning system. We have the Holy Spirit with us. And our hope is through this message that we can share some tips and tricks the Holy Spirit has shared with us and with others on how we can better navigate through fights because they're inevitable. So Henry, why don't you pray for us and then we can jump in. Yes, God, I thank you so much for this day. Thank you that you are a good God. Thank you that you created us because you love us and you want to be in a relationship with us. And I thank you that you have created other people for us as well to walk with and be in a relationship with. And so I thank you, Lord, that you help us today to navigate through those relationships that are a challenge, that are difficult, and we don't know what to do next. We pray for your insight and your help. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So we summarize this into a couple of key points, and Henry is going to take away the first one. But just for full transparency, 
these are some things that we have been challenged with, even in this recording, as Henri might say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the very first point is when it comes to fighting fair in a relationship is that you have to choose the prize that you are fighting for. Here's the thing. The prize, the outcome, the end goal that we are fighting for, that will determine whether we fight fair, unfair, or dirty or clean. See, I think sometimes people have this idea or this mentality that a relationship with conflict is wrong and I'm not supposed to have any conflict. And the moment that a, a crazy conflict arises, we want to step out of that relationship and say, I don't need this anymore. And then we move to the next relationship seeking something else that is perfect. And then we find the same conflict in that relationship again, because the reason is we are the problem. Uh, you will always, when you have two people together, there will always be conflict. And so we need to get to a place where we determine what are the prize that we want to fight for. And we need to ask the Holy Spirit to come and work in our hearts to change us for the better so that we can be like He, like he is. Turn into um, how Christ lived on earth. That is how we should live. And so now that we know that, we know we're going to go through conflict and we want to learn how to fight fair. So fight a dirty fight looks like this you are fighting for the sake of being right and you are doing it at the expense of the relationship fighting well is finding a solution mm. for the sake of strengthening the relationship and so what we fight for will determine how we fight the issue will always be at stake we will always want to be mr or mrs right we will always want to be able to prove at the end that i am right at the end of this conflict but the thing is there is a relationship at stake and so most of the times we're going to have to let go of that right to be right in order for the relationship to be maintained and the, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, there's something very much bigger that is at stake, and that is our testimony of Jesus Christ. So as a follower of Jesus, I want to reflect Him. I want to do what He did on earth. And so the people outside are going to look at me. Their eyes are going to be on me. They're going to focus on me. How do I act around my parents? How do I act around my colleagues? How do I react around my husband, my friends? And they're going to keep their eyes on me waiting for the day that I make a mistake or, um, yes, just make a mistake. And so we need to realize what is at stake is our testimony of Jesus Christ. And so the main scripture that I'm focusing on today is Colossians 3. And so we see that Paul twice confirms that Christ is the center of it all. In Colossians 3 verse 11, he says, Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. And in verse 17, he says, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. So it's important to know when we fight, we need to determine what is the prize. Am I fighting to be right? Am I fighting for the issue? Or am I fighting for the sake of this relationship to last in the long run? Yes, let me just wrap up this point. So just to remind us, we are we are not just fighting with people, we are fighting for a relationship. And the one thing that the two of us have realized as we have been preparing and in this season, we have faced a lot of conflict and we've realized that conflict is a journey. It's not a destination. We most certainly aren't there yet, but we are applying what we have learned and we are ready to face any challenges, hardships, struggles, because we know we will overcome it by the strength of Jesus Christ. Yes. Uh -huh. That leads us into our second point, which is we need to recognize our old coaches and unlearn those moves. So every superhero story has that one person that teaches the younger hero how to use their powers well. In the movie Spider-Man, it might be Iron Man guiding him. In Rocky, it is Apollo Creed. And later on, Sylvester Stallone's character, Rocky, can do that for Creed's son as well. We all have these coaches that teach us how to fight. Take a moment, maybe recognize in your own life, whether it might have been the TV, it might have been your parents, it might have been friends around you, it might have been relatives, it might have been other influences that you've seen. But recognize that we all have learned how to fight inadvertently. Even if you say, I'm not a conflict person, 
we've all have some methods of fighting. Some of it might be I hide in the closet. Some might be I'm just out there bashing, using my tongue as a weapon. We all know how to fight in some way, shape or form, but we don't know how to fight fair. And like Henry said, our win isn't to be right. Our will is, and our, our win is for God's will to be done and his peace to come. And the inspiration that we get from there is from the ultimate coach. And when Jesus was asked this question in Matthew 5, he starts listing off all of these things that were almost counterculture, upside down to the kingdom as it stood right there. And in Matthew 5 verse 9, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Now that son does not just talk about the gender, but it talks about the stand place that people have, the right standing that they have. There's an inheritance. And like Henry says, whether we like it or not, people are looking at us. If I'm wearing a Pepsi shirt and I'm drinking Coke, it reflects badly on the company because people aren't just thinking about the shirt that I'm wearing. They're thinking about what it stands for. What are we standing for in our relationships? And are we doing what Christ has instructed us to? And then the next, what I would say is the key inspiration on how do we address this? Jesus When asked this question in Matthew 18, he says, If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out their offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others and go back again, so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. This is very important for us to know because so many times we jump the gun. We jump the shark, if you will. We are on our phone the moment that conflict happens and we're calling our best friend, our mom and her neighbor instantly to let them know about what happened in this fight. Where God says, no, the way that we do it is differently. We always pursue things in love. Our heart is not to win. Our heart is for him to win. Our heart is for his kingdom to win. And so it might be counterculture. It might be different than what we are used to. But that's the kingdom of God. It teaches us not just a different way, but a better way. That is so good. Now I want to take us back to Colossians 3. We're still in point 2 that says, recognize your old coaches and unlearn some old moves. Now Paul reminds us in Colossians 3 that we are a new person. We have a new life in Christ. And he reminds us to set our thoughts on things of heaven. And we need to put to death the things of our old life. And then he tells us what are these things that we need to unlearn? What are these things that we need to let go of? Because we are now a new person in Christ. He wants to tell us how we we should live, but first he's telling us the things that we need to let go of. And so he says in Colossians 3 verse 8, but now, today, not tomorrow, not yesterday, today, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. And Paul encourages us, he says, put on Christ, put on this new nature, let go of these old things. So when you're in conflict, let go of anger, let go of rage, unlearn your malicious behavior, unlearn slander, unlearn using dirty language. It might have been okay in your old life, but now as a follower of Jesus, you have this new life. And Paul says, get rid of that. And he encourages us as we read further in verse 12, he says, Since God chose you to be a holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Verse 13, this is my favorite part. He says, Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Jesus didn't tell the disciples, if you get offended, he said, when? It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. We will get offended. And so Paul tells us, make allowance for those mistakes. Do not start using dirty language, but instead dress yourself with kindness, tender hearted mercy, make allowance for someone else to make a mistake and be ready to forgive them. Why? Because remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And so something I've I've 
learned in conflict is especially between the two of us but with my sister as well with my parents with friends I've learned that when we're in conflict the first thing that I do I go to God and I say Lord you need to change that person have you seen the unrighteous injustice that they have done they were so unfair Lord please change them um help me because I am so holy you know that's the response I usually have in the midst of conflict like I have no perspective of what the other person is going through. I'm just seeing what I am going through. And the one day as I was going through this, God reminded me of reading the story about Martha and Mary. And so Martha was working very hard. Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. And then Martha walked up to Jesus and said, I'm working so hard. And Mary is, you know, she's just chilling and she's just sitting at your feet and she's not working at all. And that's what we do. You know, she probably had this conflict in her heart towards her sister. And what was interesting for me is Jesus didn't respond with, Martha, I hear you. You know what? I'm going to fight for you. Why don't you just sit down and I'm going to tell your sister to come and help you? That's not how he responded. He responded with, Martha, why are you so worried? Why are you so troubled? Can I help you first? And so I think this is a very important thing when it comes to conflict is to allow the Holy Spirit to change us first before we try to change the other person. Mm. Allow the Holy Spirit to come and work in your heart first. So be the one to say, I'm going to make allowance for the other one's faults and I am going to clothe myself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness. And here's the thing with clothing yourself with that is people will see it. Because you're wearing it. So that is how you will know that you are clothed with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, etc. As people will see it. And so to just wrap up this point, there is some dirty fighting techniques that we use. And I want to ask you to listen to this list and ask the Holy Spirit, which one of these are mine and which one should I unlearn? And so some of them are silent treatment. You just walk away and say, see you in three days. Bye bye. <laughs> Other times um, we avoid it. It's the same as the silent treatment. You just say, oh, nothing happened. Sweep it under the carpet. I just avoid it. Just to clarify on that, a lot of times we as Christians think that that is the right response, just to not address things. But as Henry shared, this is a point that most experts that we have talked to on this topic says that this is the the biggest point of contention in, in arguments and in conflict is people avoid it and they don't address it. What do we do when there is darkness? We don't try to chase it out with a bucket and try to like, you know, like pick up all the darkness and throw it outside. No, we turn on a light. And so the reason why we're sharing this, if it might feel like it's convicting to you, is to say, Lord, help me in this. You can continue. Yeah, Sorry. so... A, an example that might help you. So I'm the one who avoids, right? I'm the one who is silent and quiet. I sweep it under the rug. And my husband is the one that immediately he's like, we need to address this. Let's speak about it right now. Okay, so some other dirty fighting techniques we use is we use ultimatum words like always, never, when it just happened two times or just once. Um, we dig up the past, sarcasm, blaming, condescending, uncontrollable behavior, belittling. These are some of the dirty fighting techniques that we use. And we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us unlearn these. And one last thing, and then we'll dive into the last into point number three is as a child, I remember when my sister and I would watch certain TV shows, we would really, really fight dirty with each other. And I realized that the things that I'm watching influence the way that I fight. And so we need to be aware of what are the things that comes in through my eyes, my ears, because they will come out of my mouth. And so we need to protect those senses to make sure that we can fight fair. And that leads us perfectly into our last point, which is how do we prepare to fight well? Just like any UFC, MMA, boxing, athletic thing where there's conflict or physical altercation, you have to prepare, you have to stretch, you have to know what you have. So many times we try to go into a proverbial knife fight with artillery at our back. And like Henry said, so many times we use these dirty tactics. We use the false sense of entitlement that we have to say, oh, no, no, I'm going to change this person. I'm going to change this person. But we need to remind ourselves that Jesus said to us that blessed are the peacemakers. And instead of looking for where we are right, we should look where we can honor 
because that is the kingdom's approach. The kingdom's approach isn't just saying who's right and who's not. It is saying, how can I honor the next person? How can I honor the person in this relationship? Whether it's my spouse, whether it's a friend, whether it's a coworker. And so the first thing that we do is we have to go and pray. Prayer is not our last defense. It's our first line of offense. It's our first line that we go to for wisdom. And so many times we use that to say, Lord, change this person after everything has happened. Where sometimes if we have an uncomfortable situation, and that has been the biggest guiding piece of wisdom in our relationship and in so many other people's relationships that we have spoken to, is the fact that whenever there's a big conflict moment, before we go into it, because you can feel it coming, you just say, let's just take a moment and pray. Let's surrender this moment to God. And then think, where could I have been wrong? Because let's be honest, we live in a sinful, broken world. And there is none righteous, no, not even one. So all of us fall short of God's glorious standard. And even if you're wrong, 10%, we need to take ownership. Matthew 7 verse 3 to 5 says, Why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me get rid of the speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your eye? Hypocrite! First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see enough, well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Notice there how Jesus says it three times. There's a biblical significance when something is mentioned three times. That's a promise from God. And so the number one thing that we have to unlearn is that the way that we know how to do conflict, the way that others have told us to do conflict is wrong. Honestly, it's wrong. And we have to trust the Holy Spirit to show us the correct rules of engagement. We have to trust that he is with us. He's our advocate. As Jesus said, it's better for you that I leave for if I leave, I will send another advocate to be with you always. And we have to trust that the Holy Spirit is with us. I do not go into a court proceeding representing myself, expecting to win against a big corporation. Neither should we go into big conflicts or small conflicts or conflicts of any size without proper representation. There's there's a statistic that I saw that said that if you want an instant failure of a court case, represent yourself because you don't know the laws well enough like a lawyer and you don't know how to act in a, in a, in a courtroom case like a lawyer does because that's their living. Why would we want to engage in conflict alone, using the broken sinful methods of the world around us, when we have access to this divine power in the Holy Spirit, and when we have God's word to guide us. For me personally, the number one thing that helped me through this was doing peacemaker training. And I want to encourage you to do a similar thing with you, with your friends, with others. And that is, how do I approach this from a biblical perspective? How do I, like we said, not do this to win? How do I look at what happened in the traffic accident and trust God to show me what did I do that caused this? Because so many times we are so often to look at the other person. But like Pastor Todd said last week, so many times it is the problem starts with us. The problem is on our side first and then on the other person. And it's our job to be agents of reconciliation as the Bible instructs us. Mm -hmm. Yes, I want to focus on, as we wrap up this word today, on what Shami shared, that we have an advocate. We have the Holy Spirit. He's our overwatch. He sees the traffic. He sees the reason for the congestion. He sees um, he sees the solutions, how to get out. And so I want, to re- I want to remind you, you have the Holy Spirit to help you through difficult situations. And I would love to take this moment just to pray over every single one that's listening and watching this word today. So God, I thank you so much that you're a good God. And I, I pray Colossians 3 over us, Lord. I thank you that we are a new person in Christ Jesus. As we have accepted you, we've been clothed with you. And I 
I ask Holy Spirit, would you come and help us that we unlearn the old moves, help us to get rid of dirty language, malicious behavior, that we get rid of slander, being ugly with each other and just pointing out everyone else's mistakes. Help us to get rid of that. And I ask Holy Spirit that you would help us then to come and clothe ourselves with love, kindness, tender hearted mercy, that we would be able to make allowance for each other's faults. And I pray that you would show that to us. And I pray for those who do not have a voice, that you will help them get a voice, help them to um, be verbal and to say out loud what they are experiencing. But Holy Spirit, I, I thank you above all that when a situation seems impossible, we know it's an opportunity for God to come do a great work within us. And that is my prayer, that we will experience you doing a great work in all of us that are going through conflict and challenges and struggles so that, f- that the relationships can win in the end. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And just one last final bit of encouragement. If you are going through a season and a storm and we recognize that your situation might be different from ours, the one truth that we have realized in our marriage, the one truth that we've seen throughout healthy marriages is that we are not meant to do this alone. And that's why we want to be here to pray with you. We want to be here to walk this journey with you because we are not made to isolate. The times in our marriage and in our relationship when we were out of line, we had people in our lives that could speak into us, that could tell me if I was being crazy or if, or if someone else was, was giving me false information about how I'm, how I'm supposed to treat my wife or vice versa. And that is where we are better together. And I want to invite you right now, if you feel like you're doing this alone, we have relationships and resources ready for you. Reach out, hit that button on the description box below. Let's pray with you. Let's walk this journey with you. Be blessed and we'll see you again next time.